throughout all this, we learn a little more about the hijackers. Except for Mr. Brown, who, as I already said, is useless. Mr. Blue is an ex-mercenary who worked in Africa for a time for $5,000 a month, which caused his living expenses to skyrocket. This was back when $5,000 a month was a lot of money. Anyway, the work dried up. He ran out of work to do in Africa, so to keep up his large living expenses, he decided to pull off a massive heist. This works with his character. I can see him being a mercenary once upon a time. He's got that menace to him. Mr. Green, as was already said, is an ex-subway conductor who got fired. Now we know why. Some drug smugglers were using his subway to traffic their wares, and he was blamed for being complacent in it, a charge which he still denies, and really, we don't have any reason to not believe him. So, now we know his motivation. Also, Mr. Gray was kicked out of the Mafia because they felt he was too crazy. So that tells us a little more about him. He's actually too crazy for the Mafia, which makes you wonder how he even got this mission. We've seen Mr. Blue to be, be a very precise person so far. Why would he take chances with a guy who the Mafia thought was too crazy? Well, at least we know no more about the character. We're not going to learn much more about these guys. We really don't get to know these characters that well. It's not a character-driven movie. It's a plot-driven movie. And not that there's anything wrong with that. We do learn a little bit about these guys. But that's pretty much all we're going to know about them. Oh, and there's Mr. Brown, too, but again, we don't know anything about him. Garber's lie buys the cops just enough time to get the money to the station, and they send two unarmed cops down the tunnel to deliver the money. However, as they're doing this, an unknown SWAT team member, who I guess just got bored, fires off a shot at the train. Not only does he hit the train, he actually hits Mr. Brown in the arm. This enrages Mr. Brown, causing him to fire off into the darkness. This causes the SWAT team to fire back at the train, hitting nothing in particular, causing all the hijackers to start firing their guns off into the darkness, not hitting anyone. After order is restored on the subway train, we see the Mr. Blue-Mr. Gray rivalry pop up again when Mr. Blue gives Mr. Gray a command and Mr. Blue Gray tells him to go blow it out his ass. This confrontation is very, very close to its tipping point, but we're not quite there yet. Mr. Blue even makes an allusion to wanting to kill Mr. Gray, but we'll come back to that shortly. As promised, Mr. Blue sends the conductor out onto the tracks, has him walk down a few feet, and then shoots him in the back, killing him right where the SWAT team members are able to see. Radioing in, letting them know that he's made good on his promise, he gives them 30 seconds to get the money to his train, or someone else will die. The money is delivered, as planned, and now the hijackers have one less set of demands. They ask that the power be supplied back to the subway, that all the lights in between the subway car and the end of the line be turned to green, and that every cop between the subway car's current position and the end of the line be cleared out so they don't see a single cop as they drive the train down the tracks. Now, during all these scenes, the police chief is trying to come up with theories as to how they may make their escape. The cop comes up with the theory that the hijackers are planning to start the subway, jump off, and leave through an emergency exit while the cops are busy chasing the subway car down the line as it speeds along with no driver. Garber points out that this is impossible because a dead man's switch is on the controls. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but can't a dead man's switch be beaten by a combination of duct tape and rope? I mean, it's not exactly 21st century technology we're dealing with. I'm pretty sure there are ways around a dead man's switch. Sure enough, right after this scene, we cut to Mr. Green and Mr. Brown constructing a device right outside the subway car that will allow them to bypass this dead man switch. If you ask me, all they needed was rope and duct tape, and those complicated looking poles and devices they have might be a little overkill, but whatever, I guess I don't really know how the thing works. So finally, the hijackers split up the money, 250000 to each person, start the subway car and lock it on accelerate and jump out the back. The hippie reveals that he's an undercover cop 
pulls a revolver out of his sock and jumps out the back with them. As imagined, the cops are all chasing the subway car, believing that the hijackers are still on board. The subway car keeps going faster and faster, beginning to freak out the hostages as they realize that nobody is actually driving the train, causing them to all go into a state of panic. Some of them more than others, though. For instance, the old man remains adamant that eventually they will run into a red light, which will inevitably stop the subway. Everyone else is quick to point out that every light they can see in the distance is green, and they're not coming up on any red ones, but the old man is a veteran of the subway process and has never ever known every single light on a passageway to be green. The four hijackers then take off their hats, their coats, and their mustaches, revealing that they really do look quite different than they looked on the train, and really they were some nice disguises. Here we learn that Mr. Brown, interestingly enough, is played by Wilson from Home Improvement. I thought this was kind of weird, because on Home Improvement, Wilson is an intellectual, and in this movie, he's a dumb brute with a stutter who has no personality whatsoever. I guess this is one actor that just won't be typecast into one kind of role, but again, it doesn't matter, Mr. Brown doesn't do anything. In another moment that kind of sort of bothered me, Garber instructs the police car that he's in to turn around all of a sudden. He suddenly came up with the idea that maybe the hijackers came up with a way to beat the dead man switch and are, as the police chief theorized, escaping through an emergency exit while everybody's chasing the subway car. Now, why is he the one to come up with that? As soon as he heard the theory ten minutes ago, he shot it down. Why is he all of a sudden thinking, oh, gee, maybe they came up with a way to beat it? Why didn't you think about that ten minutes ago? I don't know, it's kind of weird. And maybe he only got the idea because the subway was going so fast that it just made no sense for the hijackers to be on it. But it kind of bothered me that it wasn't the police chief who wasn't demanding that his theory be taken seriously, opposed to Garber suddenly contradicting himself. In a fairly predictable moment, Mr. Gray refuses to give up his gun as the four prepare to go into the outside world again. Eventually, this causes Mr. Blue to shoot Mr. Gray through the heart. Nice shot, Robert Shaw. The three quickly begin to divvy up his share of the money between the three of them, so now each of them have $333,000 or something to that effect. Mr. Brown, however, has caught a glimpse of the undercover cop and is peering out into the subway tunnel, and he gets a face full of bullet for his trouble, falling onto the tracks dead. And that's the second thing Mr. Brown does in this movie. He gets shot again. So long, Mr. Brown. Mr. Green escapes outside the subway, while Mr. Blue stays behind trying to get into a gunfight with the undercover cop. As this gunfight goes on, Lieutenant Garber heads down into the subway to try and find the hijackers. Blue wounds the policeman, walks down the tunnel, and is about to execute him when Garber shows up with his own gun. He tells Mr. Blue to give up, and Mr. Blue indeed drops his gun. But he's not going down easy, oh no. After learning that New York no longer executes its criminals and realizing that he's facing a life sentence, he puts his foot on the third rail of the subway track, thus electrocuting himself in memorable fashion. Oh, that's gotta stink. So with three of the four hijackers dead, they have only the ex-driver to find. Meanwhile, the runaway subway car eventually stops thanks to a fail-safe device where the subway will immediately be halted if it exceeds a speed of 70 miles per hour. So, everyone on the subway car is safe after all. Oh, and that old woman? She finally wakes up having missed the entire ordeal. I wonder how they're going to treat this in the new movie. Feeling fairly confident that it must be an ex-subway conductor who was the fourth member of this gang, Garber and Jerry Stiller's character go on a hunt for ex-subway conductors fired in the last five to ten years. After a couple of swings and misses, they find Mr. Green in his apartment who just got done celebrating over his newfound cash flow. He hides the money and lets them in, and they very nearly find the money twice, 
and even though Mr. Green's alibi is very shaky, they decide to leave. Unfortunately for Mr. Green, he sneezes right as Garber is closing the door. Now, Garber heard one of the hijackers sneezing over the communicator a few times during the ordeal, so after two seconds, he puts two and two together, comes back in through the door, and gives Mr. Green a great look. And that's the perfect way to end this movie. The emotions never overblew, there was never any super emotional speech, it never tried to be some kind of epic movie. It's a good crime drama, some decent action, good comedy, very underrated movie, and I'm very excited for this remake. I don't know what they're going to change in this one, but I hope it's not too much. Hope you all enjoyed my review.